Hi, I'm Lori Pendleton, and I'm Director Emerita uh, of the North American Archaeology Lab at the American Museum of Natural History. Well, I've had two lives. My first half of my life was as a wife of an airline fighter pilot. And we spent a lot of time in Micronesia. And I became really, I hadn't finished my degree. I got married at 19. And when I decided to go back to school, I'd become so interested in Micronesia that I thought I'd study anthropology. And so I finished my bachelor's degree doing that. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But a friend of mine, right after I finished my degree, a friend of mine who was going to go to graduate school with me uh, said, have you ever been to an archaeological site? I said, no. He said, why don't you come and visit? We're digging at Back Bay, Newport Beach. I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. And I walked on that site, and an energy came up through my feet. It's really even hard to describe. Um, that was it. That's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so I changed my major, uh, not my major, but certainly my focus to archaeology, but I really didn't know where I wanted to fit in with that. So in, at, in those days, we kind of learned to do archaeology by doing contract archaeology in Southern California, which was really competitive and really vicious. And um, it didn't end up being something that was very much fun. And um, I didn't like what I was doing. So I went to a friend, a very dear friend at UCLA, and said, what am I going to do? I hate this. This was what I was going to do for my whole life. And I just hate it. I hate the way people treat each other. I hate them. They're suing each other, and it's just horrible. He said, go to the Great Basin Conference. Everybody gets along in the Great Basin. You're going to love it. It's so much fun. Great Basin, where's that? OK, so off I went with my best buddy, Joy. And we took our 280Z car, and off we went to Las Vegas to the Great Basin Conference. And I sat down in the first session, and Alan Leventhal was talking about a projectile point typology that had been devised by David Hirsch Thomas. I had never heard of either one of them, but he was talking about it, and he was giving a very good presentation, and this little old lady got up and started ripping him a new one. It was Emma Lou Davis, and she just went on and on and on about how horrible this was and how normative it was, and on and on she went, and I didn't know what she was talking about. So then this guy gets up, very nice looking guy with a beard, and he said, well, Emma Lou, actually, I think you're really talking about me because this was my typology, and it was David Hirsch Thomas, of whom I'd never heard of anything. But I was listening to him, and it's, what he was saying was sounding so interesting. And I kind of bumped my friend. I said, gee, that, that guy was a really interesting fellow. So we decided to go to the next paper that he gave. And he was talking about regional archaeology. Regional archaeology, I'm, wow, with that. And then he talked about how you sample and how you figure out what's going on in a whole landscape. This was back in 1977 when people weren't talking about that kind of thing. And I'd never heard any of this stuff. So I really was impressed. So I went up to him after his paper, figuring he was another graduate student like me. And I said, hey, kid, basically, how'd you figure that out? What did you read? Who'd you, well, that is really interesting stuff. How do I figure this out? I want to do that. And he just kind of looked at me and he said, well, I read it all in Jim, jo Jim Judge's dissertation. I said, Jim Judge, who's that? And so he filled me in on all that stuff. Well, it turned out to be a complete lie. He'd actually invented all that, I found out later. And um, so we got to talking, and, and I said I wanted to do paleo Indian archaeology. And he said, well, we're doing a project next summer that might interest you. It's out at Lake Tonopah. And I said, where's that? And he said, it's in central Nevada. And I said, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, he said, how would you like to be part of the project? Why don't you write to me? And, and we'll see whether or not we can work this out, because it's all about paleo Indians. I said, oh, wow, I really want to do that. He said, well, it's a six-week project. I said, gee, that's a problem. I can't get away that long. My husband won't let me go. He said, huh? And I said, I can't, I can't leave Jack for six weeks. That's just not what I do. And he said, well, uh, why don't you think about it for a while, and we'll talk at the SAA meetings. And so I went home, and I asked Jack about it. And Jack said, oh, no, six weeks, that's way too long. So I put, sort of put it aside. And then I went to my professor, Frank Fenning, and I said, you know, Frank, I met the most interesting kid. He said, who's that? I said, his name's David Hirsch Thomas. Well, he just went, what? <laughs> David Hirsch Thomas, he's famous. And I said, what? And he said, don't you know anything? I said, you're my professor. You never mentioned him. Who, how, who is this guy? He said, oh, he's famous. He's famous. He said, he's the first person to come along to beat my scores at the University of California uh, PhD exams, graduate exams. 
I said, no kidding. Wow, he must be really smart. He said, he's really smart. He's published all kinds of stuff. Go look him up. So I went and looked him up, and I thought, oh, God, what did I do? What did I say? And then I got really intimidated, and, and um, so I wrote to him and said, uh, gee, sorry. <laughs> and so then we started corresponding, and uh, he was very nice to me, and, and he encouraged me to come out to this dig. And I'd never really been away from home before on a dig. I'd always done my digs local and go home at night. So this was, he told me, living in a tent in Nevada. And I said, well, you know, I can do that. Um, but he said, you really should come for the whole time. I said, I'm really, I really can't. Jack won't let me. So he said, well, <laughs> OK, if you can only come for part of the time, be sure and come for the first part, because everybody makes friends. And they'll all have clicks. And you won't fit in. And he looks at me like, I'm going to fit in anyway. And um, so I said, well, OK, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So I talked to Jack. And Jack said, that doesn't work with my schedule. I, unfortunately, I'm going to be home the first three weeks of that dig. You could go the second three weeks. So I wrote back to Dave, and I said, Sorry, can I go the second three weeks? He said, let's talk about it at the SAA. Well, I was so intimidated by the time I talked to him at the SAA that I literally walked into a wall. We were, we were going to get coffee, and I was <laughs> kind of looking at him, and we were talking and everything, and I just kind of hit this brick wall, and down I went. And so he sort of picks me up and puts me back together, and off we went and had coffee, and I was so nervous. But he finally let me come, and um, I did come for the second three weeks, and I brought my tent from in my little Volkswagen, and I tooled up to central Nevada, and I had this two-story tent and 10 gallons of sparkless water, and I was just ready to do archaeology, and I show up in my bikini and my jeans, and I'm ready to hit that lake. And he comes out, and he looks at me, and he says, what are you, he says, you know, you're 10,000 years too late. I said, what? He said, it's a Pleistocene lake. I said, oh. So that was kind of my introduction to Nevada archaeology. We're working at a place to see Lake Tonopah. My crew chief is a 17-year-old kid named Bob Kelly. And we would get up at the crack of dawn, just at light, start walking transects from west to east, where I found out later from an amateur archaeologist you could see the obsidian best because the sun's coming up and it shines on the obsidian. You want to go the other way in the afternoon so that you could see the chert. So uh, one night, Dave and his wife and I were having Chinese food in the Rex Cafe in Tonopah. And he said, you're in Southern California. And there was a woman back in the 30s who worked out here. And she was really an interesting person. She was a professional archaeologist, worked with her husband, and ran an interdisciplinary project at Pleistocene Lake Tonopah. She wrote two pages on it that began somewhere west of the Rockies, comma, and she made a big collection out here. And we don't know where it is. And you think you're such a hot shit little archaeologist. Why don't you go find it? I said, sure, I can do that. So I went back to Southern California and assumed that since she published in the Master Key that it was at the Southwest Museum. But the Southwest Museum was really in shambles. And it was mostly not open anymore because an earthquake had damaged its collections. And it was, they were all bundle on the floor. But I did try to find to get hold of someone there, and they said, no, they didn't have it. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I went back to Frank Beninga, who seemed to know everything, and I told him about Betty Campbell and her collection. And he said, well, she lived out in 29 Palms. Why don't you go explore out there and see if maybe someone out there knows anything about the collection? So I did. And I went to Joshua Tree National Monument. And it turns out she'd given her whole collection to them. So I wrote back to Dave and I said, hey, guess what? I did find it. He said, that's great. Um, can you send it to, pack it up and send it to New York? I said, no, no, sorry. Can't do that. He said, well, why not? I said, because I'm going to do it for my master's thesis. So if you want to find out about it, maybe you want to be on my committee. And he said, I don't do that. I don't be on com people's committees. And I said, well, too bad. So he was on my committee. Uh, I finished my thesis, and Dave decided, because I was married to an airline pilot and I could fly for free, that I would, it would be very handy to have me do the analysis of uh, lithics that he was interested in in Western collections. 
because I could fly back and forth to New York and deliver my deliverables. And mostly I did um, things that paid my salary. I worked for the BLM, I did lots of different kinds of projects. And um, that I learned lithics with, in the first place was pretty amazing. And my mentor, Jean Hattori, is the one who taught me all about that. Um, but I, I really enjoyed working in Nevada because it was the Old West and you met such interesting characters. I met Yosemite Sam, who tried to shoot me. Um, I met all these incredible people, uh, and I loved doing archaeology out there. So my second big project after my master's thesis uh, was doing five million acres in west central Nevada and finding every site and getting people who hadn't done their site forms to do their site forms and fill them out. and do a synonymy of sites, all the different names that they'd been called, all the different numbers that they'd been given, where they were, township and range. We did UTMs at that time, every artifact that had ever been found on that site, and all the publications about it. So it was a wonderful piece, and it's still actually available through the BLM. Uh, and I love doing that. And then our next project was Hidden Cave, and uh, it was a site that had been dug in way back in the, in the 50s, and, well, actually in the 30s by Wheeler and then in the 50s by Roust and Grosch Cup at Berkeley. And then we were doing it again because it was being trashed. And so we worked with an incredible archaeologist from the BLM, Brian Haddock, who could turn straw into gold and gave us very little money, but it turned through a series of lots of different things. So we raised a lot of money and did a wonderful job there and then proceeded therefrom. So when I finished my thesis, Dave hired me as a research assistant and had me working in, on Western collections. Um, and it all went just fine. I was happy as a clam working in San, northern San Diego County in my little house in Rancho Santa Fe and working for a museum in New York that I'd literally never heard of until I met Dave. Um, then I ended up getting divorced and I didn't have any airline tickets anymore. And so I thought, well, Rather than be a bag lady, I think I'll move to New York and keep my job. So I did. And um, started working at the museum. I was given Margaret Mead's office, and that was pretty thrilling. I, I had it until I retired. Um, the aura at that museum is unbelievable. It's 150 years old, and the collections are unparalleled. And I was in charge, eventually, of the North American Archaeology collections and working with outside researchers and studying the collection and dealing with the bureaucracy. And it, it was all personal relationships. It was wonderful. And I, through my whole career in archaeology, I think the thing that I enjoyed the very most, as much as research, even more maybe, is, is the people that I've met, and the people, who, particularly the people who've been so generous and have helped me and always taken me seriously when I, even when I didn't take myself very seriously. Um, it's been a real treat, and I'm still very, very close friends with all my graduate school buddies who really raised me. And um, I learned more from them than I did any of my professors, and that's the advice I've always given students, that when you decide on a graduate school, the most important thing is your colleagues and who, who are going to be your best colleagues, where you fit the best. That's more important than who the professors are, because they can leave. And so that's what, the way I've always advised my students. We've had lots and lots and lots of students, and that's the best part of the job. Um, and keeping track of them, we have a, a North American Archaeology uh, Facebook page, and they all check in regularly, or, and we all have, always have a cocktail party for them every year at the SAA meetings. And it's really, really fun to track their careers and watch them succeed. It's wonderful. Our museum's different. It's a private museum, which I didn't, I didn't know anything about it at the time. But it was, a private, it, it was started as a private museum by Boss Tweed and a lot of the New York wealthy folks who decided that um, New York, in order to be an important city, the most important city in America, had to have a culture. And they started the Met. They started MoMA. They started. It, it, there's a level of philanthropy in New York that doesn't exist anywhere else in the country, and I came to really appreciate that. Um, over the course of the, the museum's career, it went from doing strictly 
research and exhibitions to education. And our, our goals are education and conservation. Um, and that's the way the whole museum is designed. There is a formal PhD program now at the museum, the Richard Gilder School, but it's all in comparative biology. We don't get involved in it very much. They have a master's program in teaching museum studies to high school teachers and getting, giving them master's degrees. Um, so there is quite an educational component, but North American archaeology has been, always been kind of independent. We've been very lucky to be well funded. We've had the same grant for 45 years, one, 45 years of one year grants on St. Catharines Island, um, and the grant is from the Edward John Noble Foundation. And Edward John Noble started out by being an incredible marketing man who invented Lifesavers. And from there, he bought Tetley T and TWA and ABC Television. And, and when he died, he left it all in a foundation, and his daughter began running the foundation. Her husband, Yoke Larkin, was a trustee at the museum. And they had an island that was completely private, off the coast of Georgia, and it was dedicated to research and conservation and education. So it fit in with the museum's goals perfectly. And Dave was asked to go down there. Each of the curators, each of the divisions, were asked to send a curator to the island to see what kind of scientific potential it had. And most of them, it's an island. So biologically, it's not real diverse. It's, uh, so most of the curators got a little fed up. And Dave took a look around and didn't want to go there at first, but once he got there and looked at this island that's the size of Manhattan with nobody living there, one person living on the island, one family, uh, he said, gee, this seems like it has a lot of potential. And then he found out there was a Spanish mission there. And growing up in California, just like I did, he was a real mission freak. We'd all been to all the missions in California. That's what one does. And um, missions were just a huge part of the culture out there, arts are still. So we thought, wow, I could find my own Spanish mission. This would be really cool. Well, the Spanish mission in Georgia, unlike California, was very, very early. It was from 1566 to 1680. And he thought, this would be a piece of cake. I can find that. Well, it's a deciduous forest, so you can't find that. And so it took 10 years of really hard work, of transect surveys, probing every three feet. If you hit something hard, it's cultural because the island's made out of, sh of sand. And then so you follow that up with test pits every time you hit something hard. You find the distribution of all the sites on the island, of which there were probably, I think in the 10% transect survey, they came up with over 300 sites. And then narrowing it down to where you found Spanish stuff. So we narrowed it down to about 10 football fields, started doing auger testing, narrowed it down to three football fields, did remote sensing, and the guys who did the remote sensing, it was ground penetrating, no, proton magnetometers, that was the first one. And he said, well, you've been working on this for a week, where's the mission? And they said, well, we'll be able to tell you in five years when we process our data. And he said, well, that won't do. Um, if y'all were just going to pick a place to dig from all of this information, where would you pick? She, he says, well, I put my first test pit over there, my second test pit over there, and maybe over yonder I put a third one. So the first test pit was the church, the second test pit was the kitchen, and the third test pit was the Spanish well. And there we were. All the artifacts that Dave finds come back to the Museum of Natural History for processing. The St. Catharines collection is a little unusual because the museum doesn't own it. All of the Nevada stuff is done under antiquities permits and the museum owns the collections. And those collections are housed in perpetuity in the museum uh, and cataloged as such. The St. Catharines collection, because it's owned by a foundation, the artifacts are technically owned by the foundation and they decide the ultimate disposition of them. We thought for a while that they might stay at the museum, but as time went on, the focus of archaeology really changed to basically not being a carpetbagger, not taking things from Georgia and putting them in New York where people, where they wouldn't be as available to the people who needed to see them. 
So the foundation decided that they would donate the entire collection, including the research notes and the photographs and everything, all the field notes, to a Georgia-based institution. The first institution we picked was Fernbank Museum of Natural History in Atlanta, who didn't have a, much background in research. So we asked them to hire um, a curator for the collection. And that was part of the deal. And we had them hire Dennis Blanton, who was a fabulous, absolutely fabulous southeastern archaeologist. And he did an incredible job. But the administration of the Fernbank was not uh, very forthcoming. And they ended up not putting anything on exhibit, which was kind of the whole deal, the whole it, beautiful, incredible artifacts from the Vatican, um, medallions from the Vatican, uh, Spanish pottery, just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous stuff. We probably had 200 um, medallions, some of which were struck in the Vatican. Uh, we had one artifact, uh, a beautiful, um, Sin Picado medallion, uh, which is conceived without original sin, and it shows a depiction of Mary. It's made out of solid gold with a, a, a solid silver with a gold wash and cloisonne enamel, and Mary is uh, standing full frontal. And there have only been three found in the world. One is still owned by the family that it was given to by the Pope in the 16th century. One is in the Kremlin Museum in Moscow, and it's completely encrusted in diamonds. And ours was this blob that we, cure, we conserved, and it turned out to be this incredibly beautiful medallion. So we were really hoping that everything would go on display. Jimmy Carter introduced the gift of the collection to Fernbank, and that was the only display it ever had. It was beautifully curated, and it's available for research, but it wasn't what we planned. The museum's collections, archaeological collections, North American archaeological collections, began in about probably in 1870. And we have stuff from the entire country. We have stuff from almost every p famous site. We have the original Folsom points. We have Barnum Brown, who was our vertebrate paleontologist, dug the Folsom site. And we have the first collection from Folsom. We have Pueblo Benito. Um, the, probably the most famous site in the country. It's a World Heritage Site in Chaco Canyon. Uh, we were there in 1903, I think. Um, they ended up passing the Antiquities Act against us because we were from New York, and they didn't want to have carpetbaggers come in and steal their collections. But we have all of it, Pueblo Benito. And it's completely available to researchers, and several people have gotten into the National Academy of Sciences by studying it. So I'm very proud of it. Uh, we make it completely available. We will not close our collections to anyone for any reason, with the exception of uh, NAGPRA-related issues. And then we do consultations, but we still encourage research. Um, so the museum has done an excellent job, even though it may be in a place that most people in the country will never see. It's all available online. It's been completely digitized. It's, uh, our catalogs are available for research and all of our field notes. So yeah, that, that was really important to me. I, I worked with uh, my main colleague at the museum, working for Dave, was the first person he ever hired, Annabelle Rodriguez, who was this Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx who had no training and ended up becoming so valuable to visiting researchers because he knew our collection backwards and forwards. And he would help researchers find things that they had never even thought of that would improve their research. He was given an award, finally, by, from the Society for American Archaeology uh, just because he's a, he's a museum treasure. So Annabelle and I uh, handled all the visiting researchers. And I would handle most things. But when it came to actually getting down to the nitty gritty of where's the bowl with all of the people dancing around the interior, Annabelle, oh, it's on shelf three, you know, cabinet 14. That was Annabelle. So we worked as a great team. But it was Dave, really, who um, insisted that our collections be available for research to any qualified researcher. And he would do everything he could to facilitate that research. Okay, I started out as one of Dave's five research assistants. And my job was to work in Nevada. But when I ended up moving to the museum, eventually I replaced all the other research assistants and became the first 
uh, director of the Nels Nelson North American Archaeology Lab at the American Museum of Natural History. And it was named for Nels Nelson because he was the first curator of North American Archaeology and we wanted to honor him. He was an amazing person and um, came from Denmark, had one eye, um, worked everywhere, but primarily is known for his work in the Southwest very early in the Galisteo Basin. And we have all of those collections as well. So as director, we started a program of uh, internships. That was one of the, there were many aspects to this job. I handled all the bureaucracy, all the foundation work, all the staff, interacted with the whole museum bureaucracy and got things done. And, um, but the best thing that happened was when we hired Matt Sanger, um, who had just finished his degree at Columbia, and he wanted to start an internship program much like he'd experienced at Crow Canyon, which I still think is the best internship program in the country. Um, and so Matt began advertising this internship at the museum. It became one of a kind. No one else does what we do at the museum. We gave kids who were usually right after their uh, BAs and thinking about going to graduate school, lots and lots of diverse experience both in the field and in the lab, learning how to do, to curate collections and, and do research. And from there, give them lots of advice about where they would fit in best in graduate school. So we would start with 12 students each semester, and for that we often had 200 applicants. And Matt would weed them down to really top-notch. We had the cream of the crop. We've had 48 PhDs and I think about 70 MAs from that program. Um, very proud of our students. And so I ran that uh, through Matt. And then I also ran um, all the visiting research in the collections and um, did research on, on, up on my own. And what else did I do? I was responsible for all of the North American archaeology, so I facilitated all the visiting researchers. And well, I think I did some other stuff too, but it was a pretty diverse job, and it was really fun because it was different every day. And you know, we often had school groups come through. Um, I still have a letter in my office from this third grader named Emily who said, you know, that was really interesting what you do. But when you showed me the frozen shockwaves in that obsidian flake, that was cool. And it's hanging up right in my office. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, I just showed her how the, the, the physics of it the force goes through and comes back up and makes these conchoidal fractures and it, it, she just loved it. It was really, really fun. That's cool. But I also have thank you notes from Patty Crown, you know, for access and it, it's really a wonderful job. I think when I started doing archaeology, like most archaeologists, you do it because you really enjoy it. but it doesn't really mean anything. Then I had the fortunate experience to go to Acoma. And Acoma is a unique Pueblo. It's called the Sky City, very, very high up on a mesa. You go there at their behest. They do tours, and they take people there. And as I was taking the tour, it really hit me in the face that anthropology began as a white colonial conceit. It really didn't involve Indians, except as informants. Indians aren't informants. And when you go to a place like Acoma, that's been there for 1,200 years at least, um, and you see Indians who are completely empowered because they've never been removed from their land, you come to realize that it's not OK to study people like bugs. And you have to figure out some way of contributing to their better good. Not just making the collections available to them, but really listening and finding out the things that they want to tell you that are important to them about what you do and modifying your behavior to do it. 
Um, I really thought when I went to Acoma, my God, what have we done? We've been studying people like bugs, and it's not okay. And so I just had this complete psychomotor breakdown up there, and Dave was dragging me off this mountain down the steps that Nels Nelson walked down in 1912. We have a picture of it in the museum, and saying, well, we have done some good things. <laughs> and he tried to explain about, oh, people like Whistler who would write to Indians who had entrusted precious objects to his care. And he'd, he'd write to them, I, I've read them, these heartfelt letters saying, your stuff is safe. It's in a brick building where it won't burn. We're keeping it safe for you for when you need it back. So they weren't just bad guys. They, they were trying to do the right thing in a period when they really thought that Indians were going to disappear. And everything the government was trying to do was make them disappear. The Pueblo Indians are different. They have a, a grounding that other Indians don't seem to have because they know who they are, they know where they're from, they've been there forever, and uh, it's wonderful to interact with them, to listen to their sense of humor, um, to try to figure out when they're totally putting you on, which is most of the time. And I ended up becoming very close friends with a couple of Acoma potters who really kind of took me in and invited me to their feast days and gave me an Acoma name, which meant white lady, white lady who washes dishes. That was me. Um, and I, I've, I've been very, very fortunate because it's really opened my eyes. When I met the potters from Acoma, I decided they needed to see our collections, particularly Chaco, because every Pueblo group was part of Chaco. And you could see it in the things they make now. With the Acoma, it's their pottery, their black and white pottery. With the Santo Domingo, it's their inlay. And when I could take Santo Domingo, uh, friends from Santo Domingo who do contemporary inlay, they still do it just like they did it at Chaco. And I can show them the earrings. I can show them the jet frog. I can show them the things that they did that they're doing exactly the same way now. There's no question in my mind. And the Southwest became a huge, really important part of the research that I like to do. And it was mostly with the Indians. And that was just a wonderful part of the job, to make my collections accessible. Also, at Acoma, I made all of the photographic collections that were done there in the turn of the century by Nelson and different scholars. Uh, I made them all available to the Acoma Cultural Center. I made all the field notes available, the catalog, any images that we had that we thought they should see. I took the two potters through way back through the dark rooms that we had and I turned on a light and there was a diorama that someone had done in the 20s of Acoma. And Emma came over and looked, she says, oh, that's where my mother's house is. Look, cousin Betsy lives over here. And it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Um, it was really wonderful. I think I've learned a lot from the internship program and working with the students. I've come to realize it's something that we've been saying, I think, since I first got into archaeology. Why isn't archaeology recognized as being relevant to the world? Why aren't we better funded? Why aren't we making an impact? I think it's be mostly because very few archaeologists tell good stories. And as a result, they don't influence people. They like doing research. They like the solitary life. They, they like, there's, Dave always says there's no eye in archaeology. But, and although it's a collaborative process, it isn't collaborating with the right people. And I've come to feel almost guilty about training archaeologists for no jobs. Um, everybody seems to want an academic job. Not everyone is well suited for an academic job. There's vast untapped troves of people who need anthropological perspectives, particularly corporate America, particularly the government. They don't know they need it, and that's our fault. And so I feel that unless we um, figure out a way to train archaeologists to present our information in a way that's relevant to the world, we're going to die. And there's not going to be any archaeology. And it's really sad. Um, most archaeologists, I think, get into it because they are interested in something, but they haven't figured out a way to make that something 
relevant to the greater good. And so I've been having a lot of problems lately training students because I really think it's important to explain to them that even when David came out of graduate school in 1971, there were two jobs available. Then the baby boomers, of which I'm part, took over, and we're never going to die. And then we're never going to give up our jobs. We're going to die with our boots on. And so there hasn't been the turnover that there should have been in when people were forced to retire. So I think that it's a, a kind of a grim future. And I, I don't see it changing much. 